Hi everybody, my name is Charlie Dobbins. I'm from uh, Duxbury, Massachusetts. Um, I, uh, I'm an attorney in Massachusetts and I tell all my clients I'm an attorney, I'm not your attorney, hire an attorney. Okay, that's always the advice that I give. I am a multifamily attorney. The only one I know like me in the whole country because uh, all I do is teach people how to buy apartments. That's my job. And I don't represent anyone legally. And every lawyer that I know wants to be me because no lawyer wants to practice law. All I do is teach people every day. Uh, my clients call me up. They have direct access to me. And the reason why I am such an expert is because I've made all the mistakes. So why bother doing it again just to let me show you what to do and what not to do? So uh, that is the whole focus of my, my practice, my whole uh, consulting practice. I obviously have a coaching program like everybody, uh, everybody else, great programs, but uh, you know, that is how I uh, take care of people and make sure that we do things right. Now, what I'd like to do, first off, I gotta, I gotta share something with you guys, and, and, and my students are gonna get a huge kick out of this. But yesterday was a very big day, big day in my life. I got my private pilot certificate. Ooh, I yes, I did. I did. Yes. Took me. Uh, um, they asked. Well, somebody asked me how long did it take you. I said three and a half days. And I said, well, 82 hours. But if you add it all together, it's really only three and a half days of flying. That's all I have under my belt right now. So, so anyone who wants to go to boot camps, yeah. fly you there. Personally, pick you up. Actually, and go. Uh, we're gonna have a raffle. You guys can come up with me. Be the first one to come up with me as a licensed pilot. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Um, what I want to do here is kind of give you an overview. Chris has asked me to come and talk to you a little bit about multifamily and how it can fit into what you're doing, all right? Now, uh, the way I teach multifamily is different than everything else, everyone else, because what I say is multifamily is not real estate. It is not real estate, all right? Let me put it to you this way. Let's say, and I was just going to call you smart over here because your name tag says smart, but I see you got to... <laughs> A brother over here named Smart too. Um, there, Link, Link and Dave. Okay, let's say Dave owns a 100 apartment complex built in 1986. It has uh, 61 bedrooms, 42 bedrooms. It has uh, um, you know pitch roofs, separate entrances, individually metered. Um, great property. And Link owns an identical property across the street absolutely identical, built by the same builder. The fact that they're across the street has absolutely no meaning whatsoever on the difference in any value. Okay, location is the same. Whose property is more valuable? Lynx or Dave's? Well, no, hold on a second. We're talking about real estate here, guys. So they're right across the street from each other. Which one's more valuable? You know, you guys in the single family? It depends upon the NOI with the cash, the income, right? All right, so if I told you that Dave's property was 100% occupied and Link's property was 100% vacant, which one would you want to buy? I'm but it's the same, <laughs> yeah, you want to buy his. Yeah, that's right, that's actually a good answer, yeah. You do, I would too, every day. Link, what's going on, man? You're hurting, let me come on in and help you from your problem. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, good point, Dave. But the fact is, the real estate is, is secondary to the equation. The, the, inch, the thing that we're looking at is the cash flow. The way you need to look at the multifamily property is it is nothing more than a factory that produces a product that people buy, that we sell. And what is that product? Careful. Housing. A lease. lease. It's really it's a contract. Nothing happens in this business until that lease gets signed. We sell leases. We sell, and that lease provides us with cash flow, all right? So uh, think about that when you're out there looking at deals. Don't turn away from a multifamily opportunity because you don't know what you're doing. You guys are in the business, and you're going to see a whole lot of opportunities, and you need to understand when I'm looking at a multifamily opportunity, it's all about the cash flow. That's it. So let me kind of give you, I'm going to do two examples here. I'm going to keep this short and fast and sweet. I'm going to give you two examples. The beautiful thing, and this is why I love multifamily, the beautiful thing about multifamily is that it's based upon a simple formula, a simple algebraic formula. And let me show you what that formula is. <clears throat> Very simple. We need three variables in this formula. And you know how algebra works. I know it's like looking at some of you, you know, not, might not have done very well in algebra. Um, you got, if you got two variables, what does that mean? We can solve for the third. Right. 
It's very simple. So here's, here's the top variable that we all look at. And this one was already thrown out there. The net operating income. All right, now that's what you said. Now let's talk about what net operating income is. All right? Income comes in in the form of rents. Expenses go out in the form of operational expenses. What we have left over is what we call the NOI. Okay? Net operating income. So what does that mean? Uh, like, what types of things do we put in that NOI calculation? <coughs> do we put in, what's that? Insurance, Insurance utilities, utilities taxes, 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 property management, property management, management mortgage, mortgage, mortgage. Uh, no, no, no to the mortgage? No mortgage? Lawyers. Lawyers, yeah, that's how that, right there, yeah. <laughs> As little as you possibly can, because I'm a, I, you know, because I don't practice. So I'm not going to help the brother in anymore. They're, they're done in my book. We have to determine what net operating income is, and it's based upon the, what is the income and what are the expenses. And in my courses, I teach there's good income and there's bad income. Bad income? <laughs> How can you get bad income? Well, if it's if some of the income is based upon security dep deposit forfeiture income, is that good income to have? No. That means somebody destroyed the place and moved out and you had to get, steal his money. Steal his money. He, stole, he destroyed your place. So there's bad income, there's good income. Now let's talk about the expenses a little bit. You know, we talk about uh, no mortgage. Well, how, why isn't a mortgage in the equation? Shouldn't it be part of the equation? And the answer is no, because all we care about is the property as an investment. The mortgage is all based upon how you as an owner did the deal. See, because we'll get back to, uh, to Dave here. Dave, even by the looks of him, doesn't have a pot to piss in, okay? <laughs> okay? <laughs> all right. So Dave, Dave has to do a 100% loan, no money down deal, all right? So he has just over leveraged his property, leveraged it up to 100%, and now he's got, he's got to run that property and earn income off of it. But Link, by the looks of Link, this guy still has the first dollar he's ever made, right? No, you don't? Oh yeah, right, you bought a wallet to keep it in. That's what it was, yeah. So Link has, Link has gone out there and he's decided, I like this property as investment. I'm not going to take out a loan. I'm paying cash for the whole entire thing. What impact does though, do those two decisions have on whether that little old lady in Unit 1B pays her rent in time? Nothing. Nothing. The property continues to operate the same exact way. So we don't want, when we look at this property, we want to know how does it operate as, a, as an investment. We don't care about how these two guys financed it. We want to be able to look at that asset across many different spectrums. How does it compare to everyone else? Dave put his, put his own spin on it. But Dave's spin has nothing to do with how we operate that property. It will eventually because Dave will run out of money. You know, look at the guy. <laughs> so, all right. So that's how we calculate the first variable, the net operating income. Now, the other pro the price, the other, other variable that we have is the price, the purchase price. Now, keep in mind here, folks, there are three prices. Right? There's three prices on a multifamily property. There's the asking price, which as we say in my class, is the, the biggest lie. Okay? Don't believe it. And I get so many of my new students they, that when they're still, still learning from me, so my offer after I did the evaluation, I'm off by 20% of the asking price. What should I do? Make the offer. <laughs> like, well, I'm not even close. Close to what? A lie? Just make the offer. All right, so that's, that's, the per, that's the purchase price. And then there's our offer price. And then the third price is a price we settle on, right? So after we do that, now we know what, the, what the, the two variables are. And we can solve for this variable that everybody kind of shakes their head at. And some people get it and some people don't. It's called the cap rate, the capitalization rate. It's a way that we value multifamily property. There is no set number. It is driven by the market. It is not made up by mere mortals. You have to understand the market that you're working in to determine what the cap rate is. Different types of property and different types of assets have different cap rates. The lower the cap rate, 
the the bet what is it the better the area the higher the price when you're dealing with a low cap rate that's a valuable asset when you're dealing with a higher cap rate that's a risky asset and the reason why we use cap rates is we want to you know those those guys in school that uh, you know that uh, were really really good at math and they, who couldn't make a buck but they needed a job they all became financial analysts in Wall Street and now they're making huge money these guys needed a way to be able to calculate out different types of investments across, across different spectrums. And so what we do with multifamily is we use the cap rate. All right, this is a very simplistic explanation, but you get it, right? <coughs> Link? Link is so sick of me picking on him right now, I can tell. <laughs> look, okay. Um, so we look at the cap rate. Different, now I, what we also look at is the quality of the asset. So this is a formula. When you understand this formula, you understand multifamily. You will never go wrong if you stick to this formula and you understand these three variables, okay? So let's take a look at what we do in multifamily is, multifamily is we categorize assets. B, <laughs> it looks, like, looks like Donald Trump. <laughs> Did anyone see that, Did everyone see that tweet? Somebody um, took a picture of the, uh, the uh, Illinois Univer University of Illinois uh, football thing and the side, the left, the, the west side of Illinois looks like Donald Trump with the flat top. It, it's very clever. So next time you watch it, oh, oh God. Next time you wait. <laughs> next time you watch a, um, uh, an Illinois football game, check out the, uh, the 50 yard line and see if you can see Donald Trump. Really. So we, we call them four, four categories of multifamily. Class A. That's where we all want to live. This building is a class A hotel. What they've done to this is beautiful. This is a class A hotel. B is slightly lower than, a, than, a, than an A. It's been around a little bit longer. It's, it gets less rent than a B does. C is, and I, I left my bumper stickers right in my front seat. After I leave, I'll come out and get everybody one. Chris convinced me to go out and buy bumper stickers because I used to joke. I said, there's a bumper sticker on my car that says life is too short to own C-class property. Yeah, yeah. As a matter of fact, why don't I can somebody run out and get them? That would be great. Where's my? Oh, okay. Hold on one second. I'm gonna have Chris run out or have one of Chris minions go out there. It's um. I'm gonna let them decide. It, it's just straight out there. It's it's a Mercedes, white Truck Mercedes. Car. It's a car. Uh, I can see it from here, and it's right on the right on the passenger side. There's a stack of. Huh? You better come back with that thing, pal. That thing is fast. That's fast. Uh, just uh, right in the passenger seat are just a bunch of bumper stickers. Yeah. Yeah, from Massachusetts. Yeah, see you later, pal. Yeah. Change the oil. Change the oil. C-class properties are properties that are tough to own and operate. I used to, I've owned all three classes. And D is a non-performing asset. D is a, just a war zone. War zone. Who said war zone? Have you come to any of my classes? No. You're pretty good. D is a war zone. That's exactly what I say. D is the kind of property you don't want to own. I've owned all types. And I didn't know I was buying a D at the time. It became a D. All right? So the thing that makes it, makes it from an A to a B to a B to a C to a C to a D, what is it? Uh, 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 time. Obsolescence, yeah, time. Nobody goes out there and builds a class C today. You build a class A, and you just wait 20 to 30 years, and it becomes a lesser grade. All right, so the cap rates on these properties start out like, you know, 2%, New York City. Two, we're looking at two. Over here to C, I'm just going to stick with C, 14% cap rate, okay? <coughs> Jeez, but that's a better return, isn't it? It's also a lot more risk. Is a junk bond a good return versus a government bond? Okay, now do you see it? This is how we rank multifamily. Now let me show you, and this is how I'm going to wrap up this sale. Uh, this sale. No, I'm not selling anything. I'm not selling anything. I promise you. I promise you. I'm just here for the benefit of my own self. Okay, let's say we have a class A and we have a class C. This is how I'm going to show you how this cat, now, now he can't get in. Um, there, goes the there, goes, there goes my car. <laughs> the heck with the bumper stickers. Here we go. Good. That's it. Yeah. Oh, that. No, those weren't the bumper stickers. You sure they got the right car? 
Let me show you how the cap rate works. And this is what we think about when we're dealing with multifamily. And this is how you got folks are gonna understand it from a single family side. Yeah, go ahead, look at, check this out. So I was sitting in Chris's office and, uh, and uh, we're talking about stuff and he's, I said, you know, I got a bumper sticker. He, and it says, life is too short, don't see class property. He goes, do you really? I said, no, I just tell people I do. He goes, you should get that bumper sticker. I said, you know what, you're right. I should get that bumper sticker. So here, I got the bumper sticker. Pass them around. Yes, this is <laughs> when you put two geniuses in the room together. together high end mastermind that day. <laughs> yes, we did. Still waiting for the first meeting. <laughs> All right, so let's take a look at exactly how this cap rate works, and you'll see how this differs from, from the single family side to the multifamily side. All right, now let's take a look at Class A. In this particular case, this property that we're looking at, okay, never get your calculators out because we're going to do a little bit of math. This, this property rents, a two bedroom, two bath rents for $2,000 a month. This C class rents, same type of unit, for $750 per month. Now folks, these are real numbers. These, this is, you can go out there and find a C class property for, uh, for uh, 750 a month for two bedroom. These are the market rents. This is what we call a top line number. But these properties are not commanding that. They're not getting it. Their leases, they're now trading these properties for $1,900 a month and $650 a month. In other words, this is what we call the scheduled rent. This is what people's leases say. So why aren't they getting the $2,000? Well, they're trying to fill the units. So they're trying to be a little bit below market so they can fill the units. So the difference between these two numbers for either property is $100. Now you come along and you say, hey, I want to buy this property because I see some great potential. I see that we can increase the rents. And if we increase the rents, remember the formula, the NOI goes up, cap rate, we make more money. All right? We want to increase our rents by 100 bucks. Now the market comes along and says, you can't increase your rents by $100 on this property without doing anything to it you've got to rehab it. You've got to fix it up. And once you fix it up, then you'll be able to command more rent. Okay, well, how much should I spend? Well, in order to do this, you're going to have to spend $3,000 per unit. Okay? And the same thing is true over here. Not much of a difference in the rent, but still a hundred bucks. Well, what do I have to do to get that hundred bucks? Well, you got to go clean it up and, you know, make it look, gussy it up and spend $3,000 per unit. So you put $3,000 down here on this side. Now, a lot of you single family people, this is how you think, and maybe I'm wrong because I don't know how you think. But anyway, listen up. You look at this and you say, wait a minute. Why would I spend $3,000 to get 100? That doesn't make any sense. Well, that's true in the single family world. Let me show you what happens in the multifamily world. Okay, this is a hundred bucks, that's $1,200 a year. Over here, same thing. Now remember what we said in that formula about the cap rate and the, and the formula. So here, this class A is a four cap. And this class C is a 10 cap. What happens to my net worth as the owner of this property when I put $3,000 in? Don't just say increases. I want numbers. How much? Because it's a formula. This is real. You can go to the bank with this. This is not like, oh, I think it's going to be this. No. We use formulas in this business at work. Divide $1,200 by .04. $30,000. Okay? How about over here with a 10 cap? What happens? Well, yeah, yeah, look at you. A little show off. <laughs> Used to hate guys like you in school. <laughs> look what happened here. Look what happened. We both spent $3,000 to get the same $100, but because this property is trading at a four cap, when I walk into my bank and I show them my personal balance statement, I can show them that my net worth went up by $30,000 this year just by increasing by $100. $100.
Is that, now do you see the power of multifamily, the power, as I call it, the power of the cap rate? That's how we build wealth in multifamily. You increase the rents, you maintain it, you run a very good business. Over here, the guy made 12,000. So go back to your original point that I was making about single family, fix and flip, $3,000. You guys look, why should I do 3,000 for 100 bucks? We don't look at it that way, we hold these assets. And when we hold these assets, our net worth goes up. You know what I'm gonna do next year with this rent? I'm gonna go up another 100 bucks. Now I'm worth $60,000 more. That is the power of the cap rate. That is how multifamily works. And that's why you do need to keep it in mind when you're out there looking at your deals. I'm over by six minutes, Chris. Good. Good. Any, any questions? Yeah. We got questions? Nice and loud and repeat if you can, Charlie, because he's paper. Sure. Minimum, minimum size? Okay, well the thing is, uh, multifamily, our, our numbers start at five. And the reason why it starts at five units is because one through four is considered residential by mortgage people. So over five, it starts to go. Listen, I, I, my, I have a student that has a property under contract now for seven units. I had a, a student that closed on a deal a month or so ago for about $36 million. So it, it doesn't matter. It, to me, it does not matter. It's all the same process. Question? Does it matter if it's a commercial unit downstairs with residential upstairs? That's what we call mixed use, okay? And it does matter. It does matter because what happens is when we evaluate that deal, we look at the apartments and those numbers differently than we look at the, at the retail. Let's say it's retail below. And here's why. In our business, we, if it's a residential property in this marketplace, we know exactly what the, what the market vacancy is, what the market occupancy is. We know what, what's called the absorption rate for apartments. But that's retail down below. Retail is entirely different. Now when we're look, evaluating that deal, we have to say, okay, retail's tough to lease up. We're gonna have to expect a longer occupancy period, a longer absorption period. So we, we just evaluate the numbers differently. Yeah, any other questions? Good question. Go ahead. Uh, when you mentioned the amount of units, generally from a management standpoint, isn't there some kind of number like 40, 50, 20 that offsets the cost of management on the smaller units unless you manage them yourself? Well, okay. Not really. I mean, the, the, the fewer units, the more expensive the management is as a percentage of the, of the overall rent. So they look at like a, like a 20 unit property, we're looking about 10% uh, uh, rate. If you're looking at a uh, 200 unit property, you look about 45 to 5% uh, for, the, for the property management. What I teach all of my students is, is to become your own property management company. Don't listen to these gurus who are out there telling you, hey, just put, it up, put your feet up on, on the desk and, and run it by remote control. No tenants, toilets, and trash. Just travel to Haiti and tennis. If I hear that guy say that one more time, I'm going to scream bloody murder because it's baloney. This is a business. You've got to run it like a business. You take your eye off the ball for 90 days, you'll have nothing to come back to. All right? So, and the nicest thing is, you know, there's, there were times when I've owned some property that, you know, it wasn't that great. I, I, you know, I tell the story, I owned a 116-unit uh, Class C property down in Fort Worth, Texas. And they were having a heat wave. And it was, uh, uh, it was landlord paid utilities. Oh. No, oh yeah. Can I tell you, I told you I made all the mistakes. Yeah, yeah I'll never let you do that again. All right, so, so what happened is we're having a heat wave. And I'm walking around that property and I'm looking at every single in-wall air conditioning unit, full blast, 24 seven to go full blast. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm not making a dime this month. Right. The windows are open. Oh yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and the oven, the oven door is down and it's turned to full blast and like the guy's got his head in it. Exactly. You're not making a dime on that. Unless you run the property management company, then the first dollars, you take your percentage off the top every single month you're always getting paid. You gotta own the property. I mean, there's so many ways to make money in multifamily, that's one of the best ways. Question over here? Uh, how hard it is to finance properties like that? It's not hard, it's all based upon the, pro on the deal. I mean, if the deal's a lousy deal, you're not gonna get it financed. If the deal's a great deal, it, money will come swarming to you. Yeah, you. so sure. Good questions. So would you do the, I know it's just arbitrary, but would you invest the three grand to get the extra hundred on that particular? 
Yeah, because it, and th would I invest the three grand on this on the C class? You're saying? Oh no, on the on the A class. Would you invest it to pick up? Oh yeah, I definitely would. I mean, the, the thing is, if I bought, there's a reason why I bought this property. Now, th and we're we're talking, you know, uh, uh, theoretically here too. In this scenario, there's a reason why I bought this property. I bought this property because I knew if I put three thousand in, I'm going to make thirty thousand dollars more. Would you invest with me in that deal? Everybody would all. Why are you? Th why are you pausing, Link? Well, how many, that was an easy question. Well, how many units are there? If there's 100 units, you're gonna spend three million to make an extra 30 grand. To me, that doesn't oh, seem. Yeah, no, right. per yeah. unit. Yeah. Yeah. If yeah. if I had 300 units and I knew that I could put put 3,000 into each one, and I'd be worth 30 grand more per unit. Okay. I, yeah. My kids are going to private school with that deal. Your kids are gonna be uh, driving the bus. <laughs> Short the short bus. Yeah, yeah, because of you. Hey, hey, you guys laugh all you want to. My kids actually do ride the short bus. <laughs> Why? You know, there's always one in the crowd. And I walked in, I said, that, kid's, uh, that guy's kids drive the short bus. And I knew right by looking at you. Any other questions? Anything else? Okay, great. You guys have been. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I like B. I like B. See, what happens is, is A's are built by the big insurance companies, by the pension funds, by where the, where the big money is. I mean, look at this hotel. This wasn't a guy that's been saving his pennies all day. This, is, this wasn't financed by an insurance company or a real estate fund uh, that has tons of dough and they had to put it to work. Okay? Now, that, that investment group has a, an investment strategy. And that strategy is going to say, we're going to hold this asset for seven years or ten years, and then once it becomes less of a grade asset, we're going to sell it, take our money off the table, and go build another one. And so what happens is you've got a whole bunch of these types of properties that come up for sale you know, every so often. This property has never been, let's say it's never been for sale before, because the people that financed it and built it now run it. And, and so what happens is when it comes out of that, that, that fund, that strategy, then it starts to come down, it's A minus, it's B plus, now, now it's going to start coming out to the secondary market, that's us, that's when we start looking around. No, if it gets a C, where's it? did you get a bumper sticker? <laughs> I mean, did you, what? yeah, life is too short. With time. Yeah, with time. Yeah, you don't want to, because what happens is when you buy the property, you are probably going to hold it for five to seven years. All right, so you'll buy it at a B and keep it as a B and then get rid of it before it turns into a C. Yeah, yeah. Question here, did. Is it possible to take a C to a B or a B to an A? Okay, so here's, the, here's the, one of the things that, that I love is that some of these gurus teach you, like all you got to do is buy a C in a B area and then go fix it up and you're going to make millions or I'm going to buy a B and an A and move it in. Love, it's going to be great. And the thing is when you come out of those guy, that guy's boot camp and you call the broker, hi, I'm looking for a, a C class property in a B area. And the guy holds his hand over the phone and says like, I got another one. What, what are we trying to unload today? Let me tell you. And so you, he says, you know, and you're calling up some emerging market that uh, some guy talks about in you know, Fort Worth, Texas, and you've never been to Fort Worth before in your life. And, and you say, oh, really? It's a C-class property, a B area? Absolutely. <laughs> brokers lie. I'm sorry if there are any brokers in here, but they lie. And they're going to tell you, like, hey, everything you want to hear. So they hear you say, you're looking for a C and a B, and they'll say, yeah, I got the one, perfect one for you. You'll love this one. If the guy really had a good quality deal, like a C property in a B area, is he going to give it to you? He'll give it to his best friend. Or He's going to give it to a guy who's performed many times for him. You've got to build a relationship with that broker in order to find those types of deals. They don't just drop off the trees. And don't believe it when a broker tells you, hey, i got a C and a B. You're going to love this one. Because you've never been to that place. You don't know what a C-class area is. Okay? What's that? It doesn't matter. You see, because an A class, like I use four. If this was New York City and you found a four cap class A, you'd buy it. Because an A class, in New York City, an A class is probably more like a two. So it all depends upon the market that you're in. Okay? That's it? How'd I do? Yeah. yeah. Now that's an applause there, Chris. Thanks, buddy.